Phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Wednesday, February 15, 2023. Coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network in Mississippi. A black man is almost killed at the hands of a white sheriff's deputy who allegedly shot him in the mouth while handcuffed. We'll show you disturbing images and provide you details about this case. The white man who gunned down 10 black people at a Buffalo, New York grocery store last year sent us today. We'll also show you video from the hearing and hear the shocking comments the gunman is making a year after committing mass murder. The National Association of School Psychologists held its annual convention in Colorado last week, but hotel security broke up a gathering held by the association's president and they're not happy about it. We'll tell you, we'll talk to the president about what the hotel had to say about this incident. A black freshman Tennessee uh, representative is causing a stir with House Republicans because he wore a dashiki on the floor. We will talk with him about how he's, how he's representing his culture uh, amidst the sea of whiteness in Tennessee. And folks, we mourn the loss of a business giant and HBCU supporter, Tommy Dorch. He passed away a couple of hours ago in Atlanta. We'll pay tribute to him right here on a show that he had a great appreciation and love for. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best belief, he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. All right, folks, a strange case out of Mississippi where a black man came very close to being killed at the hands of white sheriff's deputies who literally shot him, shot him in the mouth while handcuffed. Michael Corey Jenkins was in the Braxton, Mississippi home of Eddie T. Parker on January 24th when the deputies burst through the front door and handcuffed the man while searching Parker's residence. According to Michael's attorney, Malik Zulu Shabazz, the six white Rankin County sheriff's deputies falsely accused him and a friend of selling drugs and dating white women. When the officers didn't find anything, Shabazz says they used excessive interrogation methods to coerce a confession. The officers held the man for, for the, held the man for nearly two hours, repeatedly punching, kicking, slapping, and shocking them with stun guns, even poured various liquids over their faces. According to a report uh, in CapitalBnews.org, as of Monday, Jenkins remains in ICU at a, at a hospital uh, where he was under where he has undergone at least two different surgeries. The Jenkins family took a photograph of him in the hospital about two weeks after the shooting, giving a thumbs up. Uh, the bullet to his mouth has caused permanent injuries to his brain, and he has lost the ability to speak because his tongue was surgically removed due to the damage by the bullet. As of today, the six white officers have not been identified. The Mississippi Bureau of Investigation is leading the investigation. We've reached out to Malik Shabazz, Jenkins' attorney, and his family. We have yet to get a response. Let me bring in my panel, A. Scott Bolden, former chair of National Bar Association, PAC, also attorney here in D.C., Robert Patillo, host of the People's Passion Politics, People Passion Politics on the News & Talk 1380, WAOK in Atlanta, Rebecca Carruthers, vice president for Fair Elections Center. Uh, Scott, this is, this is one of those cases where um, you absolutely... Uh, would hope that there's body cam footage to actually see uh, what took place. Uh, the last thing you want to do is uh, go by, frankly, uh, the testimony of these officers to describe what took place. Well, you, you know you got to pull the police reports. That's where the lies start. We've seen these cases before. But what was the motivation? It's such a strange case. They accused them of dating white women and interrogated them for two hours. Why haven't the police been identified? Why isn't there an internal investigation? There's just not enough on this matter. But you got this young black brother in jail. Can't I'm, not, I'm sorry, in, in in ICU. He can't talk. His life has been permanently changed. And by the way, is it, are charges pending against him? Lots of questions. But uh, we got to get to the bottom of this because the 
the county or the state ought to be investigating this. Uh, they should. And, you know, you know, we've done a, a number a number of these stories, Robert, uh, you're an attorney, and I swear, uh, the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation pretty damn busy with cases of the Mississippi. Uh, yeah, you know, you'll think these jurisdictions will learn after a few of these settlements uh, that it's uh, no longer economically viable to keep beating up and killing black folks. But I would love to hear from these officers what exactly the justification they could articulate for shooting somebody in the mouth. That is, that is the most striking part of this, because even uh, if you go by the standard excuse to police officers use, he was reaching for my gun, he was resisting arrest, uh, what would motivate you, what would cause you to need to shoot somebody in the mouth? And this is why the, uh, the need for nationwide mandatory uh, tamper-proof body cams, body cams that record directly to a cloud, they cannot be turned off, they cannot be disabled or covered up by the officers, are absolutely required. And this is also why there has to be federal legislation so that officers to do tamper with body cams, they face civil rights charges. Because we, we have to have an unbiased uh, view, an unbiased witness. As you mentioned, the individual, the victim in this case, can no longer speak on his own behalf. And all we can go by is what the officers, quote unquote, uh, put in their report or what they say. And as we see, something is not adding up here. And we have to have independent voices that are able to protect the rights of individuals. Uh, Rebecca, uh, this the, this is Associated Press story. Uh, the cops uh, claim uh, a gun was actually pointed at them, uh, and that's why that took place. Uh, again, we know a lot of these ex examples. Uh, I, I would hope there's body camera footage to actually see what the hell happened. So I have so many questions. If there was a two-hour interrogation, at what point was there a gun that was pointed towards them that required them to discharge a gun um, in his mouth, towards his mouth, to cause brain damage as well as damage to his tongue, resulting in it being cut out? My other question is, is it standard operating procedure to interrogate someone for a couple hours and not check to see if they actually are in possession of a firearm before you spend two hours interrogating someone? This simply doesn't doesn't make sense, but it doesn't make sense because it does not make sense. I know that the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation is busy with all sorts of things. Maybe they're too busy um, still researching to see if Brett Favre stole some, um, um, some, um, some money from poor folks in Mississippi. But either way, we're going to need the Department of Justice to step in and to actually do the investigation here. Uh, indeed. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We come back. We're going to talk about what happened in Buffalo, where the white racist was sentenced to life uh, in prison without parole. The family got a chance to also have their victim impact statements, uh, and they got real tense in the courtroom. We'll show you what took place. Folks, you're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Black Star Network is here. I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows, and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. 
Hi, I'm Eric Nolan. I'm Shantae Moore. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, for the courtroom today in Buffalo, the white man who gunned down 10 black people uh, in the grocery store in May of last year, uh, sentenced to life in prison without parole. This is what the judge laid out. What she did was uh, she made mention of every single person who was shot and killed and handed the sentence down uh, tied to each particular person. We're going to have that um, uh, in a second, folks. Then uh, also, of course, he also apologized uh, in the court, but also got real tense as well. And so uh, we, will, uh, we will have that uh, for you uh, in just a second. Uh, I, I must say, um, you know, look, he had already pled guilty, uh, Rebecca, uh, to these crimes. And so the opportunity to hear what he had to say, but also the family had the opportunity uh, to, get, to say their piece as well because of how uh, his actions just devastated so many families. You you know, there's nothing that he could have said today that would have brought back um, those who lost their lives in this horrific um, incident that occurred. Um, and, you know, it, it also bothers me at times because when we see these tragedies happening, especially towards um, Black Americans, sometimes we're expected just to immediately forgive. And it takes a while to be able to forgive. I'm not even convinced that we should all, we should readily be offering our forgiveness because it seems like it's almost like a solace um, to the perpetrator. Um, but, you know, I really grieve for those families and I feel for those families. It was such a horrific thing that happened. And I want to center around those um, folks who lost their lives rather than the actual perpetrator because it's uh just senseless. Uh, and again, it, it, it was one of those things uh, where today, again, uh, where the judge, um, you know, so many people, of course, were just shocked and stunned uh, by what took place. Uh, here is uh, the judge speaking uh, in the courtroom. And other similar hateful acts across the country motivated by white supremacy and replacement theory are a reckoning for us as a nation. The ugly truth is that our nation was founded and built in part on white supremacy, starting with the treatment of Native Americans by the first European settlers, to the cruel, inhumane, economic engine, nation-building practice of slavery, to indentured servitude, to Jim Crow laws, to government policies creating segregated public housing with communities of color often placed in environmentally hazardous locations. To the manner in which expressways were built, dividing urban neighborhoods to create easy access to government subsidized developments in the suburbs with restricted covenants prohibiting the sale of suburban homes to African Americans. All right, folks, um, the, uh, the man who, who uh, of course, uh, did the killing uh, in the courtroom, uh, he actually, that was, first of all, that was um, Judge Susan Egan. Uh, and so uh, the man who actually uh, did the killing, uh, he apologized and offered this uh, statement. So this is what uh, Peyton Jenden had to say, listen to the war on... I'm very sorry for all the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Looking back now, I can't believe I actually did it. I believed what I read online and acted out of hate. I know I can't take it back, but I wish I could. And I don't want anyone to be inspired by me and what I did. 
Folks, it was extremely emotional in their courtroom. At one point, uh, a family member, uh, overcome with emotion, lunged at Jinder and had to be restrained by authorities. Other family members did have an opportunity to share their thoughts about how uh, Jenna's action uh, hurt so many in Buffalo. My name is Kimberly Salter, and I stand here this morning on behalf, on behalf and with my husband, Aaron Salter. My family and I are here this morning, and we wear red and black red for the blood that he shed for his family and for his community and black because we are still grieving. Our grandmother, our grandmother went to buy seeds for her garden on May 14th, 2022. She may not have been able to plant those seeds but the seeds that she planted throughout her life are abundant. The same way she brought us together on Rich Street is the same way she brought unity and solidarity to the masses. We fondly remember waking up from our sleepovers to the smell of Sunday dinner while getting ready for church. She was the driving force for our fishing trips and our camping adventures. Our grandmother had a strong and resilient spirit. She will not be present for our milestones, but we stand strong and determined and triumphant in ways that you could never fathom. We find strength in knowing that her legacy will outlive you. You will simply go from a name to a number. You will be herded like cattle. You will be shut away from the world. You will not enjoy family events. You will not enjoy outings with friends. You will be nameless and faceless, and we feel sorry for you. We pity you even. Your life was meaningless before May 14th, 2022, and you woke up every day feeling small. You clearly did not value your own life, which allowed you to devalue the lives of others. Even with all of the heartache that you have caused, you still have failed to break our family spirit. You thought you broke us, but you awoke us. We all know the pure hatred and motivations behind your heinous crime, and we are here to tell you that you failed. I watched you kill my mom. I watched you on the internet. I watched you shoot her once, reload, and shoot her again. I just want you to remember that name and what you did. On March 14th, you killed Celestine Cheney, Rabita Dury. Andrew McAuley, Kathleen Mosley, Markel, Marcus Morrison, Haywood Patterson, Andrew Saunders, Geraldine Talley, Ruth Winfield, and Pearl Young. These are the names of the victims you decided to kill that day. My daughter, Robin Curry, was a young woman. She was not married. She had no children. She never will. Robbie was our youngest daughter. When people ask, how many children do you have? I don't know what to say. Will I ever be able to enjoy August 11th, her birthday? May 14th, how will my family ever have a nice, on a beautiful spring day. How do I look at her Christmas stocking hanging? 
every year. Today, when I think of Robbie, I don't think of her like this. I need this picture to remind me she was a beautiful girl. You took away my mom. Scott, um, again, very difficult day in that courtroom, and clearly uh, those families are still devastated by uh, what this white racist did. I can't take it, man. I'll tell you. I, you know, I chose to be a lawyer because I grew up watching my daddy try cases. I've been in those courtrooms with similar situations, and um, this racism thing, man, has so many components to it, so many tentacles. I've never really understood racism and why. I've never had a problem with race in this country. I've had a problem with others who have a problem with the color of my skin and the color of your skin. And it has devastated my people. It has. And in 2023, when you look at the video of that courtroom, that's America, Roland. That's where we are. That's a microcosm of America. Guns, racism, white supremacists, criminal justice system, black and whites against one another. We can't help, we can't hate all white people, but we can hate pure evil, which is what these mass murderers bring and racists bring and racial violence with them. And it's gotta stop. And we are not prepared as a country, elected officials or otherwise, to deal with the race question, to deal with the gun issues, right? We accept gun violence in exchange for the Second Amendment. We do. Shame on us. Shame on this country and how we would argue that we're the best and the brightest, because we're not. As long as we got racism, gun violence, and racial violence, it is still a struggle for America to reach its pinnacle and to give us the promise, to keep the promises of uh, fairness and justice and equality. We're a long way from it. And when you look at that video, you see how far away we are from, from that utopia, from that American dream, from that, this experiment being successful. That's what I think. Robert? We have to stop treating these as individualized events. Uh, we have to look at this for what it was. We talk about we talked about during the trial um, the fact that he was radicalized online. Uh, we need the Department of Justice to take these cases and treat them in the exact same way that we tra uh, we treated the war on terror because this is the war on terror for the black community. We are still to this day being terrorized by white supremacists, whether it's in Buffalo, whether it's in Charleston, uh, where, uh, whether it's in any of these other white supremacist shootings that are happening around the country. There's nothing—I'm I, I, a Second Amendment advocate. There's nothing that tells me that that uh, of many a means a young white boy was able to simply afford a, uh, a Gucci-down AR-15, body armor, helmet, training, tactics, etc., all on his own. The same thing with the Uvalde shooters, the same thing with many of these other shooters. We need to be investigating and breaking down these terrorist networks that are expanding throughout the country because we are seeing an increased an increase in radicalized white violence. We saw that in Charlottesville uh, years ago. We see this in these militias that are rising up around the country. Unless we take these groups seriously as a terrorist threat to black communities and to Jewish communities and to uh, LGBTQ communities, et cetera, around the country, we will wait until until it is too late to do something about it. This is the clearing call. We have to fight back. Uh, and Rebecca, very simple. The FBI directors made it clear why domestic terrorism is, a, is the number one threat to the United States, white domestic terrorism. Yeah, and what Robert just said is very important. We have to understand and see this in the bigger picture. We can't just look at it individualized. Um, the point that I was making earlier is that what we've seen with wash, rinse, and repeat is that something happens um, to black communities. Black communities are um, traumatized. The white perpetrator in court apologizes, and black community and our trauma, we're expected just to say, okay, well, we forgive you, and then that's it. Instead, we have to treat this the way Robert just said. 
We have to understand this is a long line and continuity of white terrorism and white racism against black communities in this country. We have to begin to view it that way instead of these just singleized um, instances where we're just like, okay, we have trauma, trauma happened to us. Okay, let's forgive, let's move on. No, this is the systemic. This is not going away. And it's about damn time that this country does something about it. Indeed, indeed. All right, folks, hold tight one second. Uh, we'll be right back on Roland Martin Unfiltered, the Black Star Network. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, folks. Uh, also, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. We'll be right back. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Next on Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, listen to this. Women of color are starting 90% of the businesses in this country. That's the good news. The bad news, as a rule, we're not making nearly as much as everyone else. But joining us on the next Get Wealthy episode is Betty Hines. She's a business strategist, and she's showing women how to elevate other women. I don't like to say this openly, but we're getting better at it. Women struggle with collaborating with each other. And for that reason, one of the things that I demonstrate in the uh, sessions that I have is that you can go further together if you collaborate. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. The National Association of School Psychologists held its annual convention in Colorado a week ago, and participants say hotel security at the Hyde Regency Denver broke up a gathering held by the association's president. The group was honoring Dr. Celeste Malone, the organization's first black female president in 25 years, during their 55th annual convention. The group says hotel security shut down a party in the presidential suite hosted by Malone. Guests were asked to leave, and security officials stayed in the room to make sure they did. They say no warnings were given, even when hotel policy requires one or two warnings before any action is taken. Joining us now is Dr. Byron McClure, a national certified school psychologist from Houston, as well as Dr. Malone, who's president of the organization uh, from Bethesda, Maryland. All right, so doc, so y'all, look, look, we've all been to conventions, and we all know, anybody knows, okay, you're gonna have parties in, pre in the presidential suite. So did y'all have music going? What did they say? Was it too much music? Was it too much talking? Uh, how in the world did it escalate to, all right, everybody gotta go? Well, we, they came to the door. I had given a toast just thanking the black community, uh, my students, the alumni, the faculty at Howard University, as well as my other black faculty colleagues. It was a beautiful space for us to be able to make connections, especially in a profession that's predominantly white. About 10 minutes after, around 9.30 p.m., hotel security came to the door. They asked for the person whose name hold was up. on the screen. Wait, 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 hold, hold, hold up. 9.30? 9.30. This, no, look, this, before this, their quiet hours. This start. ain't like 1.30. Nope. Okay, 9.30. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So hotel security came. They asked if my name was the one on the suite. I said yes. They said there had been several noise complaints and that everybody needed to leave and that they were going to stay there until everybody left. So I told people what had happened and everyone moved out quickly. We complied. We followed directions to the point where there were some people who left things in the suite because it was so abrupt that the ending occurred. There were a few people, some of my close family and friends, that were staying in the suite to help me clean up, and hotel security was standing in the living room and said that the only people allowed to be in the space were the people that were registered to the suite, which was me, and that everyone else needed to leave. I pointed out that the, all of these other folks are with me. They're helping me to clean up, and hotel security saw them cleaning up, and then they said that 
we would have to go downstairs with our identification for everyone to be added to the suite in order for them to stay. Okay, so did, um, did you ask for the manager? Did you ask for the head of security? And what did they say? Well, at that point, I got everyone to leave. There were a few people there, and I challenged it, that we're not going to show identification, nor are we going downstairs. Am I not allowed to be in my room with my guests? Um, since when did hotel policy change that we're no longer able to have rooms? And then I pointed out the suite that I was staying into. The, where we were was a large parlor area. I also had a one-bedroom suite next door, and I also had a room adjacent to the suite where some of my family were staying. So I asked, well, are you telling me that I can't have anyone in my sleeping quarters next door? When the security guard realized that I had both of the adjoining rooms to the suite, he backed down and said that there better not be any more noise complaints and left. Um, after that, I called the NASP executive director, Dr. Kathy Minky, to apprise her of the situation so that we could schedule a meeting with the hotel general manager the next day. So, uh, Byron, the hotel uh, has since uh, issued an apology. Hyde Regency Denver sincerely apologizes to the National Association of School Psychologists President Dr. Celeste Malone and her guests at an event in our hotel during NASP's 2023 convention for not providing them with an experience that is consistent with Hyatt's strong commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. We want to begin by thanking Dr. Malone, NASP members, and convention attendees, and the broader black school psychology community who have reached out to us to share their concerns over what has transpired this, this past week. Our goal is to treat every person who walks into our hotel with empathy and dignity, and we believe that we did not deliver on that experience for Dr. Malone and her guest on the evening of February 8th. Hyde is conducting a thorough investigation of the colleagues involved, and the entire hotel staff will be retrained in diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are working with Dr. Malone and NASP leadership to determine a path forward. In addition to retraining for team, we are planning to compensate and apologize to the individuals involved and make substantive donations to organizations important to NAS NASP. We have discussed a focus on supporting graduate education of black and other minority uh, Minoritized school psychologists. We've also invited Dr. Malone and NASP to work with us to ensure that all NASP attendees feel genuinely safe and welcome at future events hosted at Hyatt Properties. We trust we can continue a productive dialogue with Dr. Malone and NASP. Sincerely, Greg Leonard, General Manager, Hyatt Regency Denver. Okay, so here's my problem here. Okay, that's all great. It's all wonderful. It's all flowery. It's all after the fact. But uh, you jacked up the moment. You screwed that up. It was supposed to be a joyous occasion, and you completely threw water on that, Robert. So first, Robert, were you there? Oh, Byron. Bob, I'm sorry, yeah. Byron. Byron, <laughs> Byron, were you in the? I'm sorry, Byron, were you in the suite? Yes, I, oh. I was there. I was fortunate to be in attendance. And is we have to be clear, Roland, that they put out the statement, but just because they put out a statement. We can't equate progress with concessions. Right. And the statement they put, that they put out was six days after the fact. And this is a step in the right direction, but there is still much work to be done. And I don't want it to get lost that we have to have serious progress. Black school psychologists account for roughly 4% of the field. When you break that down with black men, we account for only 1% of the field. So it's more likely to become an NFL football player than it is to become a black school psychologist. And what we're talking about here is having serious progress so that black psychologists can meet the mental health needs of our young people, of our students all across this country. But this that, incident should have never happened. Dr. Malone, I'm confused here, okay? So the general manager releases that statement. Uh, where were they the next day? So the next day we met with them. Um, I met with them along with the executive director of NASP and our manager of conventions and meetings. When I told them the story, Dr. Minky, she immediately recognized it for what it was. And for that, I am grateful and appreciative that they also took a very strong stance as they met with the hotel leadership. In our meeting with the general manager on Thursday morning, I explained to him the whole story. And we asked why their security protocols were not followed. We never received a warning about any type of noise complaints. Um, I also pointed out to him that I questioned if there were noise complaints in the first place, considering that I occupied most of that floor. 
I had the largest suite in the hotel, and I also had the rooms that were adjoining to the suite, and the suite across the hall from me was vacant. Per the protocol and agreement that they had, that the hotel had with NASP, if there was any incident with a NASP convention attendee, they were supposed to call our executive director and our director of convention and meetings. That did not happen. And so I was, we were all very forthright with the general manager that the security came to the largest suite in the hotel, saw a room full of black people, and for that reason, shut it down as opposed to following their protocols. Even before we believed that we were being surveilled by the number of black people that were coming to the suite, we were warned when uh, my friends were setting up and they asked for plates, we were warned not to get too rowdy. I've been to many of these conventions before. I've been to many receptions in suites, and never have I seen anything like that when there have been far larger, louder gatherings late at night. So it was quite clear to us that this was racially motivated, and that was our consistent messaging when we spoke with the general manager as well as with Hyatt Corporate. So they're saying we're going to retrain, okay? Is anybody going to get disciplined? Is anybody going to be fired? Uh, and, and the security who came, first of all, how many, how many security people, and were they white? Yes. How two, many? There were two, and white, yes. What, a male, female? A male and a female. And the male security individual was the one who entered into the room and said that he was going to stay there until everybody left. Uh, have y'all demanded that he be disciplined or fired? We have not said anything about that. So we have been focused on the broader structural and reparative actions for, we did it, we also recognize that that is a human resources issue. For what we wanted at the moment, it was for repair for those who were immediately harmed, such as myself and all of the guests there, as well as the larger community of black school psychologists, because it violated our sense of safety. That if the president of the association could experience this, what does this say about any other black school psychologist? So the actions that we were working towards was looking at what changes Hyatt Corporate was going to make in terms of their training, and also working closely with them for in how they could use this and learn from the situation. And if they did not respond in an appropriate way, what was on the table as well was canceling contracts with future Hyatts. Uh, but for me, Byron, I want somebody fired. Uh, I want a manager discipline. Uh, I want, uh, and I want to know how many black security staff they have there. And, and then if they don't have any, I want the people hired. I mean, because at, at, yeah. at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this is somebody who decided on their own to take an initiative on their own. Uh, look, we all understand what a protocol is. Uh, and so if this is just a low-level security officer who is, not, uh, who is not a supervisor, who is not head of security, who just decided on their own, I can only imagine who else they are going, who else they are dealing with on their own. Right. And Roland, that's what we have to have a conversation about. We have to look at this not as an individual problem, but we have to look at the structural and systemic problems that led to this incident happening. Yeah, for, well, for me, I'm looking at both. No, so, so, okay, Absolutely. follow me here. For me, I want the individual dealt with, frankly, gone, because he, my whole deal is, who did this happen to beforehand? And then I want to know, y'all got any black people? Because, uh, I'm, look, I'm real clear. I'm a firm believer. White folks act a fool. They get fired, get replaced by black people. That's just me. But then also saying, all right, now let's break down exactly your whole system here, uh, because at the end of the day, um, look, imagine if this person did this to other people who did not have the power to fight back. Right, and that's a valid point. And we're looking at Dr. Celeste Malone, who is the first black female president in 25 years. And the first was Dr. Deborah Crockett, um, who paved the way. And we want to be able to propel a black school psychologist to leadership positions, to make sure that we're in the workforce so that we can meet the needs of young people across the country. And if we're unable to do that by attending NAS, then that's going to make our work that much more difficult. And so it, all of these issues must be addressed at the right. individual level as well as the systemic level. Last question for you, Dr. Malone. Have y'all have y'all uh, uh, reached out to other black organizations to let them know what took place uh, and, and to also uh, say, hey, we need allies to put Hyatt on notice. If you don't fix this, then we will make sure that other black conventions are not booked at your hotels? 
we've had that type of outreach and so much more. So there was a lot of or outreach that happened organically when NASP released a statement on Friday when some of our talks with the Hyatt stalled. Once we put out that statement saying what our demands were in terms of compensation for me, all of the guests who were at that event, as well as the substantive donations to the NASP Minority Scholarship Program, Howard University School Psychology Program, and the Black School Psychologist Network, we had a number of organizations rally, such as the Association of Black Psychologists, the American Psychological Association, the Association um, for e Association Executives. There were a number of groups that came to us and released public statements saying, that this behavior will not be tolerated. No, no, have y'all have y'all have y'all have y'all also reached out to the black convention planners, the individuals who work with much larger organizations as well. Have y'all let them know about what took place? I and personally Roland, have not, um, but I was, yes, because yeah, I, mean, I don't this know is where those we connections need your help either. And why mm -hmm. we need help. We need people to amplify what happened. We need to bring awareness, but we also need to be connected with resources. Um, we have the Black School Psychologist Network, as Dr. Malone mentioned. We're trying to have the first summit, which is going to take place April 27th through, uh, through the 28th. But we need your connections, your resources, so that this incident isn't in vain, that we can continue pushing this message forward and actually taking action and bringing about positive change for our community. Aww. So help us, Roland. We're calling you out, Roland. Help us you out. Like that. First of all, that, first of all that's, that's easy. They know about a text message. Okay, so that's like you look, tell me that 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 that's how it is. Okay, so again, you got the you got the black you got the black uh, uh, convention planners who actually do this. And then of course you got your larger organizations. You got Divine Nine. Either one of you remember the Divine Nine? We both are. I'm a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Have you reached? Have you reached out to the Deltas? Yes, I have. Okay, Absolutely. By, yeah. Byron, Byron, you remember what? Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Have you reached out to President Lonzer? And that's on our list to do as well. No, and no, no, Byron. No, Byron, have, no, Byron, we'll have you reached out to President Lonzer? I have not, but I will. Okay, you reach, reach out to your regional vice president and President Lonzer. I can send them a text message during the break. So that's how we'll handle yes, that. Sir. So uh, let us know what happens next with the Hyatt. Thank you so Thank much you. for amplifying and sharing the story. We really appreciate it. All right, folks, I appreciate it. Plus, also, I know the last four Delta presidents. I'll let them know, too. All right, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Folks, I'm over time. I got to go to break. We'll discuss with my panel when we come back. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, you're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Hi, I'm Gavin Houston. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. All right, I want to bring in Rebecca Scott and Robert here. Uh, Robert, I'll start with you in, uh, in this segment here. Uh, this is where institutions have to pay. And when I say have to pay, 
somebody got to lose their job. Some, <laughs> somebody got to lose their job. I don't give a damn, okay? I, people could say, oh, you know what? You can have mercy, you can have grace. That's at church. You can have grace at church. <laughs> Somebody got to lose their job because you ain't some white boy who decided to walk into a presidential suite. Let's be real clear. I have been to a ton of conventions. Everybody know when you in the presidential suite, let's just say you get privileges not everybody else get. And when you hear her say, I had the rooms next door and a suite across the room, across the hall was empty, who the hell complained? <laughs> well, on, on that point, Roland, one, I'm, I'm realizing I should have had a whole different major in college. I ain't no psycholo or, uh, school psychologist got down like that. That's not like what kind of party uh, that you need to be at. But, but First of all, Robert, it was 9.30. Let's be clear. It wasn't 2.30. It was 9.30. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll use the roll around for the after party around 1.30, 3 o'clock around there. But, uh, uh, but to your point, there's no reason for this protocol to not have been followed. If there was indeed a complaint, then you give a warning. You call up to the room. Uh, then you may send somebody to knock on the door a second time. And then if it's continuous complaints throughout the night, then you break up the party. But nobody goes to the presidential suite at 9.30 in the evening uh, and tells everyone to leave. Uh, and it's clear from what they said that there was profiling that went on from the time that they registered, from the time they started bringing people in. Uh, and it's not as if the hotel was surprised there was a party going on there. They asked for plates. Uh, they helped them set up the party. So the, this entire thing reeks of racial profiling and racial, racial animus. So not only should individuals lose their jobs, I would love to see a new program uh, instituted by the hotel chain to train new hotel general managers who come from the African-American community to have more owners of hotels be African-American, because the way that you remedy this isn't simply by releasing a statement, it's by ensuring that you change the practice going forward. Again, Rebecca, I need somebody fired. I need a head, you know I need a head on a stick. Roland, they were they were just simply too nice because as I was listening to them, 85% of the Hyatt chain is still owned by the Pritzker family, as in Governor Pritzker of Illinois' family still owns 85% of the Hyatt. It is Black History Month. This is unacceptable. We got to raise hell here. It is not just saying, oh, there has to be systemic change. Well, we could do both. And I agree with you. Tonight is not the night in Black History Month to be extending Black grace and Black mercy. That is not what this is. That security guard should have been fired immediately. And if the second security guard that was also with him, if she sat there and she um, and she followed up with what he was doing, that she needs to be fired as well. This is not acceptable. I have thrown many a hospitality suite through being a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha, the links, or even doing things with the Democratic Party. I've seen where organizations have been extremely rowdy, not my organizations, mind you, but I've seen you where know, they Damn well, y'all being rowdy. Stop fronting. First of all, <laughs> stop fronting. I will neither stop confirm fronting. or deny. Hold on. I, have I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I have seen where things have gotten rowdy and security was not called. But even a couple months ago, I threw a party in a, um, in a presidential suite and we had liquor, we had food, it was filled with people and it was music. And just like um, the previous your previous guest said is when you have the presidential suite, you also have the adjoining rooms next to it. So really, who are the people who are calling and saying that things are so noisy and things are so loud? Once again, this was 9.30 p.m., a bunch of school psychologists. They didn't seem like they were a rowdy bunch, but even if they were, the hotel did not follow protocol. So I'm asking the Prisker family, which owns 85% of the Hyatt um, hotel chains, what are you all going to do to make this right? It's Black History Month. Um, hey, hey, listen. Uh, and, and again, look, I appreciate uh, Dr. Malone and Byron look, coming on. I, I, I'm kind of with Rebecca Scott. They, they, they were a little too nice with them. 
Uh, Cause matter of fact, I'm hitting a brother who leads up. See again, I don't waste time. Just so everybody understand. Again, I believe in being as gangster as possible. So the brother who leads all diversity, I'm hitting him right now. Uh, and I will be hitting the Alpha president and the Delta president because I'm sitting here like, and you got to let other organizations know. I got a group chat of all these black civil rights folks. They, need to, they, they should know as well. This is where you have to send a signal. And to get, see, see, Scott, here's the deal. Corporations, they like for us to be quiet. They, mm. they like for us to keep things inside. No, hell no. You got to be noisy. You got to let folk know, do understand, we can send this thing across the country and stop folk from meeting at Hyatt's nationwide. Yeah, the apology yeah. you, ain't enough. Well, the apology is the beginning, not the end. And you can throw Denny Johnson in for the Alphas also, I'd give a call to, because he's on the road with the Alphas 24-7 at various conventions and gatherings of, of his fraternity. But, but two things. This organization spent more money at this hotel. They spend money at this hotel more than anybody else for those two or three or four days for the convention. That's the first thing, right? So what you're talking about is nobody else spending money with them. The apology is OK, but you have to be accountable for this bad conduct. Secondly, what's really missing, who sent security up there and, and, and why wasn't the manager, the general manager there, the night manager? They're there. How come they didn't come up, let alone, how come nobody called the night manager and say, listen, this is, this is complete nonsense? But this security guard, usually poor, not well-paid, white, for one night, had a superiority, had his white privilege, and he was going to tell all these black people to exercise power over them, right? So that what's missing beyond the apology and giving a contribution is demand an investigation as to how this occurred from a management and leadership standpoint so that it never happens again. Show us the report, and then we'll stop telling people not to come to your hotel, because if you don't do it that way, it's going to keep happening, and you can't feel safe or comfortable by doing business with the Hyatt Regency in Denver. So you need an internal investigation where was that night manager? And then you retrain everybody up. And you fire as many people as you can because you want to send a message. Black people spend a trillion dollars a year in total. They spend a trillion dollars a year or some ungodly number. We're spenders, right? Organizations spend. That's their bread and butter. They're in the people business. The uh, tourism hired reason, they're in the people business. It's outrageous. Just really, really inappropriate, and, in my opinion. And again, when they said, hey, we're going to make donations to organizations, nah, mm -mm, no, 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 no. Size of check. Is it size matters? <laughs> yeah, size matters. I'm telling you, look, I'm telling you right now. I, listen, y'all, look. Look, I, I, I'm oh, really, just, you know you've been thrown out of a couple of parties at presidential suites. No, no. First, I heard first about of all, one, let, 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 get into it. let me be real clear. <laughs> if I was, if I was in that suite, I'm letting you right. I would say we ain't moving a goddamn inch. Oh, I God. need no, no, no. I would have said y'all got y'all gonna call the manager right now. See, right. I would have hit exactly. that. I would have hit the ass with protocol. Right. I would have said, "Yo, ain't nobody moving. Call your boss." Yeah, yeah. Bring your then boss. They say, well, we gonna call the police. No, what they say is, we gonna call county on you. No, you gonna say that? Get, hold, up, hold, up, hold, up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, Scott. So you talking to the wrong one? I won't. <laughs> I hope you call the police on me, cause Rolling <laughs> gonna. Cause you know what Rolling gonna say? I got the mayor on speed dial. <laughs> Right, right. It's gonna be a show. Hey, now this, you real, show? No, this, this real simple. This real simple. Right. If I'm in, if, I, if I'm in, if I'm in Denver, and you show your ass, I'm telling you right now, I'm gonna hit you with. I'm gonna call the mayor. Uh huh. And then, and then keep showing your ass. I'm gonna say I'm gonna call the former mayor, Wellington Webb. Now you wanna, now you wanna go there. Just right, go there. Right. And then if you really want to go there, then I'm going to say, I'm going to call your real boss. I'm going to call the governor of Illinois. Now, what you want to do? 
And guess what? The but, party. But sir, guess what? Sir, put your hands behind your back. No, nah, that's not what's going to happen. Put your hands happen. behind your back, no, sir. No, no, what's going to happen is the party will be continuing. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Let me go to a break. Uh, we come back. We're going to tell y'all about a student walking out in Alabama. We'll discuss that. I'm going to tell y'all what Ruth Simmons, why she may be leaving pre-PB early. Uh, the white Texas a and Regents trying to truly run Prairie View and will pay tribute uh, to Atlanta businessman Tommy Dorch. Passed away today, folks. Uh, a devastating loss. And we'll uh, celebrate his life and legacy. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Blood and soil. You will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys, America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Bye -bye, What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, we told you about about 200 students at a high school in Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa Alabama, walking out uh, after they were told by school officials for the, for the Black History Month program, they could not discuss any issues that took place before 1970. These students, obviously, uh, uh, not happy at all at Hillcrest High School. Joining us right now is the president of the Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa branch of the NAACP, uh, Lisa Young. Lisa, glad to have you here. Uh, we, we read the response of the school. Has anybody actually accepted the responsibility? Have they actually said that this was stated? Was this written? Was this in an email? Or was it verbal that was told to the students? Um, it was verbally told to the students. Uh, no one had accepted that responsibility. Uh, so it was verbally told. Who told the students this? Was it a principal? Was it a teacher? Um, this was told to students by an... an it was a... It was told to by an assistant principal. By an assistant principal. Uh, and so, I, have they, I take it they reported that assistant principal. Has the school board, I mean, what, what have they actually said? Uh, you know, other than that statement the school, school that, that they put out, uh, what has actually happened? So, we've had a meeting with um, the principal. We've had a subsequent meeting with the... Um, Superintendent with a couple of school board members and some members of the administration at the board. All right, and what did they say? Um, I must say that I have been disappointed with those with the outcome. Um, no one is accepting responsibility. Um, 
it seems to come down to a situation where we have some some people that's just not willing to negotiate. So their whole attitude is, all right, what y'all got next? So what do you have next? So what do we have next? Um, the student, one of the main of the students was that you know, they did not feel that the administration was being genuine with them, that they would lobby against a tax referendum that would support the school system that failed yesterday. Um, also, um, I have been in contact with individuals with the Department of Justice. They want to come in and do mediation. Um, we met them today. Um, we're still waiting on a response from the school board. They have the Department of Justice um, come in and, and do mediation. Uh, so, um, has this assistant principal, has anybody actually called him or her in, uh, and have they admitted that that's what they told the students? No meetings that have taken place have included the assistant principal. She has not been available. <laughs> Uh, well, Lisa, keep us abreast uh, of what happens next. We certainly are interested uh, in uh, hearing how this uh, comes to a conclusion. Uh, most definitely. Uh, we want to thank everybody for the outpour, outpour of support, um, and we're trying to keep everyone up as things unfold. Um, man, that, uh, again, that's what we're dealing with uh, here in 2023. Lisa Young, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, this is one of those things, Scott, where, look, what, what we got... Look, it ain't ended, okay? It's, we know it's Alabama, but this happens all over the place. Uh, we're dealing with white fear. That's why I wrote the book. Uh, and we got to understand that we just can't sit here and play footsie with these people. We got to, prank, frankly, put that foot on their neck and keep it there. Yeah, you know, we, we got to not only put our foot on their neck, but we got to also encourage black folks and white folks to have a dialogue on this race question. White people are so afraid to talk about race. They're so either, whether they feel guilty about it or they feel proud about it, they just don't want to talk about it. They don't want to teach, they don't want to talk. America's so imperfect, but the only way you get better is to discuss your imperfections. And that national dialogue on race will never take place. Not because black people don't want to have it, but white people certainly don't want to have it. And they won't even, don't want to even teach it, quite frankly. It's not like slavery and Jim Crow and civil rights and black oppression just never occurred or it occurred. We did our accountability. We made our atonement. And let's just not talk about it anymore. Let's talk about the great things in America. Well, you just saw that video of that Buffalo mass murderer, that racist SOB being sent to that courtroom. That courtroom, what you just showed, was race in America today in a microcosm. Until that changes, we need to be talking about black history 12 months a year, and we really need to be talking to white people about black history and being comfortable with having that dialogue to eliminate racism. Until we have that dialogue, and I don't see it coming anytime soon, we're going to continue to have this race question. Uh, I I've said point blank over and over and over, Rebecca, we can't be nice about this. We can't be gentle. We can't make them comfortable. We've got to give them hell and we got at every step of the way. So I, I hear what Scott is saying that we got to talk to white people, but let's just take a moment back. This is Tuscaloosa, Alabama. They could just go right up the street to Birmingham to the Civil Rights Museum, which is one of the best civil rights uh, museums in the country, where the 16th Street bombing um, uh, occurred, where that 16th Street Baptist Church is still there. It's right there. So this is not about we have to go talk to white people about race. The people in Alabama already know about race. You could go down to Montgomery, and you could see the Truth and Reconciliation Museum, where you could see, um, you see all the imagery that is um, highlighting and showing those who um, uh, died by lynching in this country. There's over 4,000 um, 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 black folks who are honored there. And plus the, uh, the, um, uh, the 
the many other folks whose names we will never know. That's right there in Alabama. Or next month is the um, reenactment of Bloody Sunday. So it's not like Alabama doesn't have all of this imagery around race or Alabama doesn't have all this history that's rooted in, uh, in racism and the civil rights movement that has occurred. It is not where these people don't understand or don't care about. So or these people aren't aware of civil rights. Civil rights is all around them in Alabama. This is folks deciding that they don't care. And like what Roland is saying, tonight, when we think about white fear in this country, that's what this thing is about. It is not our responsibility to educate them anymore when they have all of the access and resources around them to educate themselves on race, if they so choose to. Well, but, but here's the deal, Robert. We're seeing what's happening in Florida with DeSantis. We're seeing what's happening in Texas. Mm -hmm. We're seeing how these white conservatives are doing this all across the country. Uh, and this is what we're really... At. Wait till I talk about the Prairie View story, you're going to understand this. They want to shut all of this down, we also have got to, frankly, train our black kids to not be afraid and to... I'm glad these students walked out. We got to say, no, 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 no. You got to bring, bring that heat every single day. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because this is all about who controls his story because they have never taught history in America. Uh, even the black history we had 20 and 30 years ago wasn't really a full uh, uh, counting of what America has done. It's always been his story. And even at this point in time, the little bit of black history that we got has all of a sudden become unpalatable because, as you say, in the next 15 or 20 years or so, we'll be going to a majority minority nation. They see themselves as losing power. And their fear is that when the rest of us become the majority, we will teach them how they uh, treat them the way they treated us when they had the majority. And so the way you stop that is by preemptively changing history to suit your uh, to suit your purposes, to change history to where you are always the hero. That's why you can teach that. George Washington uh, chopped down a cherry tree and told his father, I could never tell a lie. But then you find out in college, oh, he owned 300 slaves that he beat and raped for his entire life. They want to change the way that they view that history and the way that they see those things going forward. This is why it's so crucial that we control the education for our children going forward. Regardless of what they try to teach and indoctrinate into your children nationwide, you can control that at your home, at your house, in your church, in your community. Make sure your children are volunteering with civics groups, make sure they're talking to our elders who are still here, uh, who have, uh, who fought those battles on the front line and saw those things firsthand. Make sure they have a full black history education before they walk into that room so that somebody try to tell them some old bull jive, they know the truth. Uh, indeed. So, folks, uh, that's what we have to do. We got no choice to do so. Going to a break, we come back. Um, Ruth Simmons is one of the reasons why she's stepping down is that she's been battling the Texas a and Board of Regents, who are nearly all white, over the real control of Prairie View a and historically black college. Wait till we show you what she said at the State of the University address. This could reveal the tensions she's been having with the Texas A&M Board of Regents. That is next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, watching on YouTube. Hit the like button, y'all. We should easily be at 1,500 likes. I should have to be asking y'all this every single night. Y'all are commenting. Hit the button. Also, download our Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also now watch us on Amazon News. That's why I click the Amazon Fire. If you got Amazon Fire, click on the Amazon News on Amazon Fire. You can watch our 24-hour, seven days a week live streaming channel right there on Amazon News on Amazon Fire TV. We'll be right back. Most people think that these television shows that, that tell stories about who we are as black men, and then they paint these monolithic portraits of us, they think that they're being painted by white people. And I gotta tell you, there are a whole bunch of black folk right. that, are, that are the creators, right. the head writers, right. the directors of all of these shows and that are still painting us as monoliths. The people don't really wanna have this conversation. No, they don't. Start Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this 
going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, a relationship that we have to have. We're often afraid of it and don't like to talk about it. That's right. We're talking about our relationship with money. And here's the thing. Our relationship with money oftentimes determines whether we have it or not. The truth is you cannot change what you will not acknowledge. Balancing your relationship with your pocketbook. That's next on A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, here at Black Star Network. Yo, it's your man Dion Cole from Blackish, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Stay woke. All right, we've been covering uh, what's been happening at Prairie View A&M University with Dr. Ruth Simmons, uh, who was president of the university. She dropped a letter last week uh, saying that she could, if she didn't have the full authority to be president, she would be stepping down. She'd be stepping down at the end of February, on February 28th. She, we were now, we told you yesterday that uh, she's going to be becoming a fellow at Rice University in Houston. I was sent this video today because this could very well... Uh, tell us exactly what the tensions that's been going on at Prairie View A&M University. Now, now, I told y'all, when she initially resigned, when I saw that resignation letter, the initial resignation, which happened last year, I was like, hmm, this is weird. My gut was saying, mm, this ain't just what everybody... I'm like, this ain't just a normal resignation. Something is happening here. Well, uh, this is when she was speaking recently at the State of the University Address. Uh, we, this, is on, this is on YouTube. This is about 30 minutes in. About 30 minutes in. Listen to what she says. Uh, you know, I, I try not to do this uh, needlessly. Because uh, I don't see the point of doing it. But sometimes um, it's important to do these things. You need to know that the, the regents um, protested are having um, this individual on hands, okay? Um, and that we, because of the whole CRT thing, uh, we're in a period where, uh, where the system wants to monitor very closely what we're doing. Um, a director came in to me to let them know before I was going to do uh, for example, <laughs> uh, do any interview. So we are under a very uh, uh, sober Carol, you called your mom. Uh, uh, guidelines right now in terms of what we can uh, do. Uh, and needless to say, I can't take that seriously. Amen. Uh, you know, what, what kind of president could I be if I count out to that kind of
Right there, Rebecca, Robert, and Scott. Well, there was a whole lot there in that three and a half minutes. And so for folks to understand that Prairie View a &M University falls under the Texas A&M University system. The Texas A&M University Board of Regents oversees all universities within the system. Texas A&M University, the flagship, Prairie View, Texas A&M Galveston, and the other institutions. Texas Southern University is not under any system. They have their own board of regents, and so they actually have self-governance. Listening to that, Robert, said a whole lot there. She talked about, again, them wanting to, people were asking, why wasn't Prairie View closed uh, on MLK Day? Well, she said, because the, the system isn't closed on MLK Day. You heard her talking about, talking there uh, about uh, being able to, you know what, don't, don't inform them. In fact, before I go to my panel, I got Melina Abdullah, uh, and you heard her there say, she did an in conversation with Melina Abdullah, with Black Lives Matter, uh, with Grassroots, and the Texas a and Board of Regents did not want Melina on that campus. Ruth said, y'all don't get to tell us who we talked to, and she went forward with that conversation. Uh, Melina, um, and so we, we now are now understanding what happened here, uh, and so you speaking at Prairie View with Dr. Ruth Simmons caused some friction with the Texas A&M Board of Regents. Yeah, well, you know, um, Dr. Ruth Simmons is not one that you want to um, debate on issues like this. Not only did she bring me to speak, she made me her activist in residence for an entire year, the last academic year. I was at Prairie View and fell in love with Prairie View. It's also my grandmother's alma mater. Um, it is a very special place under President Ruth Simmons, and she's just been a force. I was an activist in residence. She had Nikki Giovanni as the writer in residence. Um, she was just an amazing leader, is an amazing leader. And, you know, Prairie View will miss her and has so much to be grateful for um, as, as she led that university um, and continues to contribute to the wonderful, beautiful, powerful history of Prairie View. All right, Melina, we appreciate that. Uh, we just want to get your comment there because uh, clearly we now understand the friction that was happening behind closed doors between Dr. Ruth Simmons uh, and the Texas A&M system. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having me. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Robert, uh, going to you. This is Ruth Simmons telling the Prairie View alumni, you have got to stand up and fight for black students and essentially not let these white Republicans in Texas water down and neuter a black institution. You know, I'm reminded of a work by Franz Fanon, uh, Black Faces, White Masks, that often uh, black people are put into positions, the, but the backing and the, the uh, undergirding of that, those institutions are still run by white people. And so because of that, you don't have the full power to institute your programs. You don't have the full ability uh, to, uh, to actually have autonomy over what you're doing. And so the, she's making it very clear that she has no intention of being a president in name only. She uh, does not want to be a vassal, does not want to be in fiefdom than anyone else, uh, but rather she uh, she wants to be uh, ensure that she has the ability to do what she sees being best for the institution. Uh, I applaud her for standing up in this sort of a way. I think we need this across black academia. Um, we saw this in the Atlanta University Center for, for a decade, bringing in uh, voices of leadership that were not actually interested in doing what was in the best interest of the students in particular, and we've been able to remedy that uh, going forward. But presidents of this nature are exactly where needed for students matriculating through HBCUs. Uh, the thing here, uh, Rebecca, um, that is important. Again, she talked about uh, ba uh, basically saying, "All right, well, you know, we we gonna do what we do, and then we're gonna tell y'all later." Uh, and so, for this center on race and justice, she was like, "Yeah, we just decided to do it, and then told them later, and then let's then fight it out." What she is saying is, when you've got this Republican governor who now wants to get rid of anything that's DEI, 
This is going to have an impact on state HBCUs. And what she is saying, and if you look at the resignation letter she gave, she clearly states it in there. They fight. She, you're gonna, she didn't see these words. What she was saying is, you have to fight for what is right. Fight for your institution. Yes, um, Dr. Ruth Simmons is one of the premier, one of the top um, um, administrators in the country. She is heralded for all the work that she's done across many campuses, including um, uh, the Ivy League Brown, including the work I believe she did at Spelman, at Philander Smith College, at um, one of the universities um, out in California. Like I said, she is one of the top academic leaders in the country bar none. Um, what's interesting, I had a chance to visit Prairie View um, last summer, and I was talking with some alum because one of the questions that I had with Prairie View being the A&M system and part of that system um, that is chartered, I believe, in the Texas um, state constitution is that it's also a funding question because by being a part of the A&M system, then um, there is dedicated funding that Prairie View gets that a Texas um, Southern does not get. But the problem is, is even with that dedicated funding that Prairie View was supposed to receive, Prairie View had to go to court to make sure they actually got the funding. Because for many years, just like some of the HBCUs in the state of Maryland, they weren't getting the level of funding from the state that they were promised and in law that they were supposed to get. So it's, it is a question of funding with why Prairie View is still in the A&M system and why um, some of the alums, alumni still want Prairie View to be in the A&M system. But to your point, by being in the A&M system, there are certain things that Prairie View um, can and cannot do because it is in um, the state system um, with other um, A&M schools. The, the thing here is that first, Scott, uh, Prairie View has never had one of its graduates sit on the Texas A&M universe, Texas A&M system board of regents. That's one. Uh, two, the thing that also jumps out here is that this should be of concern. These Republican governors in southern states. This should be of grave concern to public HBCUs because if we're going to now see this attack on race and diversity, equity, and inclusion, that could have devastating consequences for our state HBCUs. It's a bad equation for historical black colleges that are part of these state region systems. On one hand, they get support from the state, but on the other, they want to try to dictate to you, and in Texas, dictating to you means that you can't talk about slavery or civil rights, or you can't talk about these black issues, but you're an historical black college. Ruth Simmons is a, is a brilliant woman who happens to be black, a brilliant uh, administrator, president of institutions of higher academic learning. It is a loss for Prairie View, but it'll be even a, it's a greater loss for the uh, region system of Texas A&M and in the state of Texas. They just don't know yet because they're not smart enough to understand that this is a brilliant woman and she's going to be just fine. But, but, but this is a bad equation because this is where DeSantis and his whole issue of culture wars right. comes, comes down on, on historical black colleges in the state of Texas. And the only thing you can do is now fight. And you cannot be afraid to fight if you block an historical black college and you get funding from the state and you're going to have to get others to fight with you, build your coalition right. and go fight and diversify that board of regents. Because right now, I understood, I understand why she uh, uh, resigned, but the fight continues. Of course. The circumstances aren't going to get any better. Indeed. All right, folks, hold tight one second. When we come back, uh, we're going to pay tribute uh, to, uh, he's bigger than Atlanta businessman, uh, Tommy Dorch. Uh, of course, uh, businessman, philanthropist, very much involved. HBCUs had a deep love for black people, passed away today uh, in Atlanta. We'll pay tribute to him next right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Next on Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, listen to this. Women of color are starting 90% of the businesses in this country. That's the good news. The bad news, as a rule, we're not making nearly as much as everyone else. But joining us on the next Get Wealthy episode is Betty Hines. 
She's a business strategist, and she's showing women how to elevate other women. I don't like to say this openly, but we're getting better at it. Women struggle with collaborating with each other. And for that reason, one of the things that I demonstrate in the uh, sessions that I have is that you can go further together if you collaborate. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Hi, I'm Gavin Houston. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your boy, Jacob Lattimore, and you're now watching Roland Martin right now. Folks, as we were preparing for today's show a couple of hours ago, uh, got the phone call that uh, Tommy Dorch, uh, businessman out of Atlanta, Philanthropist, very much a huge advocate uh, for HBCUs, uh, passed away. Uh, Tommy had been battling pancreatic cancer, uh, a valiant fight, uh, and was, look, fighting up until the end. Uh, he was still traveling this country. In fact, last month, uh, we talked because he had a speech uh, in, uh, I think it was in Erie, Pennsylvania. He gave me a call, said he couldn't make the speech. He wanted me to give the speech. Uh, I couldn't. I had another speech somewhere else. I couldn't get uh, to Erie, Pennsylvania uh, in time. It just could not work out. Uh, and um, Pastor Jamal Bryant had alerted several of, a number of us uh, a week ago. Uh, that uh, Tommy, about, about 10 days ago, that Tommy uh, was not doing well. Uh, and uh, February 5th, I, I called, called him, left him a voicemail, uh, sent him a text as well, told him uh, that we're praying for him to keep fighting, that we loved him dearly. Uh, he was indeed someone who loved black people. Uh, very much involved in education efforts. It was set on a number of board of trustees at universities across this country, uh, involved in a number of businesses in Atlanta. Uh, and of course, uh, and, and he knew everyone, longtime chair, national chairman of the 100 Black Men uh, for America. In fact, Tommy, uh, he, wanted, he made sure that uh, I was named an honorary member. Uh, he wanted to pin me at the convention in uh, uh, when they had the convention when we, during COVID, uh, but they still sent it to me. Uh, and when we last talked, uh, he was he was announced he he was planning a major event in June at the national convention. Uh, he said, "Hey, I, I got to have you there. I'm stepping down as chair, passing the torch on." Uh, but unfortunately, uh, he passed away today. Uh, tributes have been pouring in uh, all across social media. Uh, we, we looked at uh, several different items. This is, of course, a photo that John Hope Bryant uh, had posted on his page. Uh, this is from a birthday celebration for uh, Andrew Young that took place um, um, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, D Nice and so many others have been posting tributes. And I, I saw a tribute from my man, a saxophonist, Mike. Phillips uh, and uh, Mike uh, also uh, paid a tribute. Uh, the phone call that I got today uh, came from Melanie Campbell, chair of the National Coalition Black Civic Participation. Uh, Tommy was the board chair. In fact, when they had their Spirit of Democracy Awards in December, again, uh, Tommy did not, he wasn't just standing down, he was still appearing places uh, and he actually was there in person. Here's some of uh, him speaking uh, in December at the Spirit of Democracy Awards. Friends that recognized me when they walked in, in. I spoke to them uh, my 61 uh, pounds December, later, but, uh, but I'm here. It's been, it's been great. But before I get into my remarks that they wrote for me, they wrote me a Bible, so I'm going to go to the New Testament, I'm not going to go to the Old but Testament here tonight, to my remarks, but I want all of the members of the board to please stand. Right, I'm going to play a little bit more of that later, uh, but I want to uh, go to Melanie Campbell. Melanie, 
Um, again, you called me, let me know he had passed away. And when I say that he was up, I mean, again, was was very much involved. Uh, folks, if y'all can show, uh, I mean, again, when they had, they were, they had the ring of the bell of New York Stock Exchange, uh, Tommy was there, he was speaking in Dallas. I mean, uh, his boots were on until the very end. Yes, indeed, Roland. Tommy, uh, we always say I, he starts out the day, he said he want to leave, start the day off, put it all on the table, and, and, and have his cup empty at the end of the day every day. And that's how he lived his life, whatever he was uh, doing. And so I feel like um, we lost a, a, a Renaissance man. He was unapologetically black no matter what he was, whether he was in a boardroom, uh, whether he was on the stock exchange, whether he was right there um, on Capitol Hill, um, wherever he was, he made sure that he focused on upliftment of our people, especially our young people. He was passionate about that. Capitol Hill, uh, you and others were on Capitol Hill last week uh, offering up uh, a resolution uh, for him to be, to be awarded the Congressional uh, Gold Medal. Uh, Congresswoman Nakima Williams uh, actually spoke on the floor of the House uh, for that. Uh, let's play what she had to say. All right, I'm going to play it in a second, uh, Melanie. Uh, and so uh, talk about that particular effort there. Well, you know, um, uh, last week, I uh, thank uh, Congresswoman Nakima Williams, who uh, from the great state of Georgia, uh, 5th District, Congressman John Lewis's old district, uh, Hank and uh, Congressman Hank Johnson and the, all of the Congressional Black Caucus members from the state of Georgia uh, came together uh, with Nakima leading it to um, nominate uh, Tommy for the Congressional Gold Medal for his lifetime of uh, service to, the, to uh, not just Black America, but to the nation. And so that was a week ago. And his son, uh, uh, Thomas W. George III, was there along with uh, several other, uh, uh, Bishop Jamal uh, Bryant, who is his pastor, along with many folks from our uh, board and others, uh, attended that um, to, to, to bear witness. And so we thank them for that. And we want to keep uh, that legacy alive and try to push that across the finish line of being able to uh, see if they, they can still get a vote and get it passed. Uh, and preferably, if, if partisanship doesn't get involved, then I think he will uh, posthumously at least uh, receive that award. And I think it's uh, worthy of that because it talks about the work. One of the things she honed in on was his love for HBCUs, which I heard right. you mention. Um, uh, undergraduate from Fort Valley State, uh, graduate uh, a school from Clark uh, Atlanta University, AU. Uh, and actually, Roland, uh, on Monday, uh, uh, Dr. George French Jr. and several of us uh, witnessed uh, the board of trustees of Clark Atlanta University actually went to Tommy's house and bestowed upon him the, um, an honorary doctorate that they had planned to do during commencement, but they did it Monday. So he also left here knowing that. And he was able to watch what happened last week. And so they say we tried, many of us, many, many people, not just uh, those of us, uh, me and others, but many people gave him his flowers while he was here to, to know it. And a lot of times we don't get to do that. So that was a uh, blessing. And it, here is that speech on the floor of the U.S. House from Congresswoman Nakima, Nakima Williams. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor my constituent, Mr. Tommy Dorch, one of our country's greatest contributors to closing the racial wealth gap. I could spend hours highlighting his contributions to the black community, but I want to focus on his investment into our great HBCUs. A proud product of both Fort Valley State University and Clark Atlanta University, Mr. Dorch founded the National Black College Alumni Hall of Fame. Mr. Dorch has led the foundation to award over $1 million in grants and scholarships to students and exposed more than 500,000 students to college opportunities. As a third generation HBCU grad, I know firsthand their critical role in fostering black excellence. Mr. George's lifetime of giving back to the HBCU community has laid the groundwork for economic mobility for generations to come. And Mr. Speaker, today I proudly join with members of the Georgia delegation to introduce legislation to award Mr. Tommy George the Congressional Gold Medal for his leadership and contributions to our country. I'm eternally grateful for the work he continues to do to advance equity and opportunity for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back. 
Saxophonist Mike Phillips was performing at City Winery in Atlanta. He posted on his uh, Instagram page, uh, God clearly had something else. Uh, and he said uh, he had an opportunity to go uh, to see uh, Tommy uh, and to play for him. Uh, and uh, Tommy, of course, was a huge fan of Mike Phillips. Mike, you performed at many of uh, Tommy's events. I often attended his big birthday celebrations. Um, that um, Was that today? When you went yeah. by? Yeah, I went by today. I mean, you can't make this up how God can align things. Um, um, like I said in my post, I thought it was about City Winery. We booked City Winery six months ago and not knowing that it was just meant for me to be here, not on the 14th, but the 15th. Originally, I was supposed to go to the house at um, 11. And I got, we, I pushed it back a little bit and got to the house and he was there. And one of the most beautiful things happened. I took out my horn and I basically, I played him Amazing Grace. And the doctors were amazed because they saw him smiling. He was literally cracking a smile. So whatever he heard from that horn allowed him to smile. We all saw it and it was just a beautiful thing. And then he he passed a little bit after that. And and I can't tell you the level of gratitude that I have for this man. He invited me on my first board ever to be a part of the Black College Alumni Hall of Fame. And being in the trenches with him um, helps you understand how dedicated he was to our community and working right beside him. Because you remember, you know, 20 years ago, HBCUs, we weren't the cool thing on the block and it wasn't the shiny thing that everybody could see and make those investments in. And he was down in the trenches before HBCUs were even cool from the outside looking in. Um, Melody, I can recall when the uh, Obama administration made some changes to the Parent PLUS loan, which devastated many HBCUs. I remember getting a phone call from Tommy saying, hey, Roland, we got to fight this thing. I'm going to be on a plane uh, late tonight. I'll be in D.C. tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, he was well known uh, by folks on both sides of the aisle uh, when it came to uh, HBCUs. He also uh, worked for Senator Sam Nunn, made history uh, as one of the first top black staffers uh, on Capitol Hill as well. And so uh, we're talking about somebody who had tremendous influence in business and politics and education in a number of areas. Most definitely. And and the thing about Tommy uh, and, uh, is that in his struggles, in these last, you think about, uh, he never stopped. He, 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 for four years, he, he, he was going through this battle. But for many that's, he didn't. He didn't talk about it, and then when he he decided to talk about it, he spoke to it, even in that, and even in going through his. Tommy suffered, you know, three bouts, different bouts of cancer over his lifetime, and he was not unapologetic about how he knew that he was blessed to have not just the resources, but the connections. And he said, it, but it should not be that way. That's one of the things he spoke about at the Spirit of Democracy War. It should not be that way, that you have to have what I have in order to get quality health care. So even in his struggles with terminal cancer, he still spoke to the issues about how it is the, the fairness of that is something that we need to all continue to fight for. So I will forever be indebted uh, to watching him live until his last breath, and he and he never stopped, and he was unwavering in that. And I think uh, uh, he lived until the end. Uh, Mike, uh, he was uh, chair of the, of, of the Grady Hospital uh, board as well. Uh, I remember being in Atlanta. This is uh, December of 21. I get COVID, Mike, uh, and uh, my doctor was like, "Hey, you need to get the antibodies." Look, I ain't stupid. For one of the first people I called was Tommy, knowing full well he was the board chair. He said, let me call you back. 
Uh, and next thing I know, uh, I'm, I got doctors hitting me up. Uh, one of the folks at the hospital had a doctor who was in Chicago who was ready to hop on a plane to fly to Atlanta to administer me those antibodies uh, for COVID. Uh, and, and if it was one thing I, I will say, uh, Tommy Dorch uh, was very well connected. If, you, if, there was, if there was somebody I did not know, and that said a lot, I know I could call him and get to somebody real quick. Yeah, I, I always had I had the uh, a nickname for him. I call him Consigliere Cheat Code. <laughs> He's the cheat code. Whenever you needed to get to something and you needed to circumvent some bureaucracy and get to the person that you needed to get to, Tommy was that dude. And the tentacles of his relationships were so diverse that it allowed him to shake and move and bring those resources back to. Um, this whole ideology that he had that was unapologetically black. And that's why we've made so many strides in raising money because he used all of his tentacles and his reach to make sure that we were straight in our community. And, and um, he fought for that till his, his last breath. Uh, indeed. Got to go to break. We come back. Uh, we'll p continue to pay tribute to Tommy Dorch, uh, who passed away today, uh, pancreatic cancer in Atlanta. We'll chat with John Hope Bryant, the founder of Operation Hope. We'll also uh, bring in my panel as well. Robert Patillo, uh, of course, uh, knew uh, Tommy well, as many folks did uh, in Atlanta and around the country. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Pull up a chair, take your seat, The Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Ha 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 Hey, I'm Antonique Smith. What up, Lana Well, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. you notice I did wear my, did wear my mask. Uh, folks, don't get too comfortable because we're having over 100,000 new infections a day. This BA5 is more contagious, while it may not be as impactful on the body. And many of you know that this is my third, well, three and a half years of battling stage four pancreatic cancer. Usually it takes you out in six months. My former neighbor and good friend, John Lewis, that passed last year, one of our great civil rights leaders. But you know, God has a plan for me. Yeah. I am focused. Yeah. And at the end of the day, folks, and I say that to begin, when our time comes, it comes. But my late friend, Dr. Miles Monroe, said that the most valuable real estate in the world are the graveyards where people went to their graves with so much knowledge and talent and resources. And he says we should die empty. So every day I get up, I empty my life for the young people of this nation, for our community, and I am unapologetic 
for working to make sure that the African American community is strong and successful because when we do what we have to do, all of our brothers and sisters, regardless of their color and race, we make this nation better. Because, as you know, I will not call a name, but there's this president that has divided this nation so much, former president, but it's us who must come together to rebuild the strength, rebuild the partnership, and work hand in hand. And that's what we're doing with the coalition and with so many partners. And let me move on because it's a lot of great awards, but we're not going to be here until tomorrow. We're going to get this done tonight. So again, the 2022 midterms elections are over. The coalition and all of our partners did a phenomenal job in making sure that we turned out in record numbers. We salute tonight's of, uh, honor. Tommy Dorch, uh, who passed away earlier today, uh, speaking at the Spirit Democracy Awards. We live streamed that event uh, in December, annually put on uh, by Melanie Campbell's organization. Uh, he was also a strong uh, voting rights advocate uh, as well. Um, uh, John Hope Bryan is the founder of Operation Hope. He joins us right now. John, uh, you were a part of a group of uh, brothers there in Atlanta who got together once a month. Y'all invited us, uh, invited me there uh, to speak to the group. Um, took place at Dikembe Mutombo's house. Uh, first of all, prayers for him as he battles uh, his brain tumor. Uh, Tommy was there. Uh, he was, of course, uh, always at the center uh, of, of things, political and economic, social, cultural, uh, in Atlanta and across the country. Your reflections on your good friend. Yeah, on behalf of his family, his wife, Carol, who I'm sure is hurting right now, his son, uh, Tommy uh, Dorch uh, the third. Um, uh, we sent our hearts, uh, 100 Black Men of America, just brought the group that you came and spoke for, and thank you for doing that, brother came at time in my request. It's uh, the loss is unimaginable. Uh, the shoes can't be filled. Um, he is a cross between and sits between Ambassador Andrew Young and Herman Russell. So he was talking about civil rights, um, i.e. Andrew Young, and made strides there, as you know. But he was also talking about what I call, what I call civil rights, economics, ownership, cutting deals in the suites. So he's sort of like Herman Russell without the real estate. I mean, he, he had, at some point, thousands of employees. People don't know that. Uh, he had incredible influence. But every time I talked to him, Roland, he was using his influence for others. Never once was it about him. I'm talking about private conversations. How do you get somebody through college? John, can you hook this person up for an internship? I call him, he called me. Uh, when, whenever, John, can you come to 100 Black Men and re receive an award? Can you, John, can you come to a, a, and talk to the HBCUs? Um, uh, it, he never once, in all the time I've known him, asked for something for himself. It says a lot. You uh, just, um, weren't you? Uh, didn't you recently go to Dallas? Like I say, he was. I told Melanie Campbell this. I said. I uh, said uh, he left us with his boots, uh, boots still strapped on. Uh, he was still going places. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, earlier this year. Uh, in fact, um, I'm looking at a text message. Uh, I'm on a group text text chat with a number of civil rights leaders and other folks. And this was uh, January 1st. Uh, he said, my year started off great. I was released from the hospital yesterday. I'm relaxing and getting ready for plenty uh, of football uh, today. And of course, many of us uh, wished him well, but he was, he was still, like I say, uh, he had to give a speech in Pennsylvania, couldn't make it. So he calls me and say, hey, Roland, can you give this speech for me? He was, he could have easily said, hey, y'all, look, I'm sick. I don't have any time for this. But he was still looking out for people. Yes, uh, January 27th is my last um, text exchange with him. I went to go see him. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Carol, for letting me to see him, his wife, um, since then. In fact, in the last week or so. Um, I just came back to Atlanta. I was going to go see him tomorrow. But uh, on January 27th, I have a text from him uh, about just brothers and what we should do. And he said, I'll call you up again on my hospital visit. <laughs> Even that wasn't about him. It was always serving, to your point, uh, and with his boots on. Uh, he was about Ph. Do as much as he was about people getting PhDs. I'm on the 
sport of Clark Atlanta University because of Tommy Dorch. Clark Atlanta University has a boatload of money. I'm talking about seven figures, Roland, because of Tommy Dorch. He could have put that money anywhere. I guess he could have put it in his pocket. He gave it to Clark Atlanta University to create an institute around entrepreneurship and community development and, and wellness. I think that's also involving Bellamy, I believe. Um, he would, he would in, ask his friends to donate, not to him, to an HBCU. And I know of one donation at seven figures that has not yet hit yet, but that's coming because of Tommy. That's about to hit at Clark Atlanta. Seven figures, Tommy directing it back to his community. All the stuff that we don't know that he did to help make this world a better place. And we all need to honor him like we honor the legacy of Dr. King with a day on and not a day off. Stop whining. Stop complaining about how bad your life is and how inconvenient your credit cards are, what, you, what club you can't go to or what thing you can't get involved with or whatever. And start to, trying to figure out, like Tommy, what we have to give and not what we have to get. He was on the board of Operation Hope. He, was, he spoke at the Hope Global Forum. Um, he was at our last Hope Global Forum in December Yep. while he was sick. Now that I think about it. Yep. Indeed. John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope. We certainly appreciate you sharing your thoughts and reflections about the life and legacy of Tommy Dorch. And I thank you, Roland, for doing this. I'd only, I mean, I'm rolling right now, no pun intended, rolling. But I wanted to, to because you called, I wanted to stop the world to do this. I don't, I don't want to get in front of the family and what they need to do. But I thought it was important uh, uh, to at least honor him. And thank you for doing this. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, his uh, niece, Angela, reached out to me. And so the family is watching. And so we certainly appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Uh, Rob Patillo, uh, your thoughts. You know, as a uh, Clark Atlanta alumni, somebody who's been at the Civil Rights Movement in Atlanta for 20 years, uh, this is a tremendous loss to the city and to the movement. And I'm not certain how it can or could be replaced. I, I don't think people from outside of Atlanta can understand um, just the impact that this man had. When I was an intern uh, my sophomore year, I interned for Thomas W. Cole, the former president of Clark Atlanta University, and we had lunch with Tommy Dorch. Uh, normally, the 19-year-old college student doesn't really get to talk during those uh, meetings between the, the big dogs. But they actually engaged me. We had a conversation about black men and mentorship and leadership. And he kind of left with me this conceptualization and this idea that it's the responsibility of each of us to uh, carve a path for those who come behind us. And that was truly the legacy that he left. Uh, you, did not, uh, you did not run a campaign in Atlanta without visiting Tommy Dortch first. That was just, it was not a thing that was done. You had to have his blessing in order to run for office in many cases. Uh, civil rights organizations and conferences, I've never seen someone donate so much and give so much of his time and resources and connections to ensure that we had a movement that could fight back and to create, really, this black Hollywood as it would be in a, uh, that Atlanta is now, that does not get built without someone like a Tommy Dorch with, uh, in building out much of the financing for the last decade or, or plus of the civil rights movement. So the, the when we lose these lions, I think this generation, the millennials and Gen Zers, need to make sure uh, that you are doing what you need to do to be in the position so that you can be that leader going forward. Because where we are today, uh, we, we've lost James Orange, we've uh, lost uh, John Lewis, we've lost Tommy Dorch, we've lost so many in the movement, that now is our time to pick up that baton and move forward, learn from their lessons, and fight the battle going forward. Rebecca, the point I made, uh, Tommy, was very very much about the importance of black folks voting. Uh, and that was a, one of the reasons why he was such a huge supporter of Melanie Campbell's organization. Yes, absolutely. Um, Tommy Dorch um, is the blueprint. Um, all I can say, especially to his family and friends that are watching, may he rest in peace. May he stand strong with the ancestors. Um, but he was definitely a man to be admired. Scott? Yeah, hey, Roland, thanks. You know, Tommy, uh, I was not close to Tommy, but I certainly knew of Tommy. I met him over 40 years ago at the first uh, HBCU day. Oh, this had to be 1980, 81. I was a freshman at Morehouse College. And uh, Tommy was probably at the beginning of his grind uh, for HBCUs. And I remember being at a rally as a, as a freshman on the steps of the Georgia State Capitol. 8081, and he was a fiery speaker and committed. He was much younger then, uh, but I had been active with some Morehouse students. 
with Tyrone Kreider and others, who Tyrone's not with us anymore. And uh, he gave me an opportunity to speak at this rally uh, just upon knowing what we had done at Morehouse. And uh, I never will forget, uh, as he stood behind me, uh, that he was introducing other speakers. But if you knew him and you had something to say, he certainly, you got to speak that day, especially as college students. And then the rest is history with his uh, legacy of not only wealth building, but he loved black people unapologetically. And he certainly gave his time, money, and resources, was the power behind the throne. I just saw him at uh, Herman, uh, at Jerome Russell's home for a fundraiser for, um, for Lucy McBath uh, probably about nine months ago. And he was there, and jovially gave me a big hug. I hadn't seen him in 20 or 30 years, but he remembered who I was. And we had a good conversation reminiscing about HBCU Day, which was the first one in the history of the country. So God bless him. When we get to heaven, he'll be there waiting on us, uh, Roland, for sure. Melanie Campbell, your final thoughts. Uh, Melanie, you're muted. Melanie, you're muted. Sorry, Roland. Uh, A. Scott Bolden, I think we were there together. And so that's how I got involved. Uh, is it Tommy Dorch uh, right. pulled me off the campus and we were doing yeah, marches on yeah. Raven Black colleges and universities. That's and, right. Uh, I want to lift up uh, Carol uh, Dorch and Tommy Dorch III and the whole family for sharing Tommy with so many of us in, in this nation. Um, and they were a dynamic, powerful couple because um, she was powerful in her right in leadership and kept the tra kept the mm -hmm. trains moving. And he would always lift her up in that way. So I want to lift the family up and, and uh, know that we are going to do all we can. I know I will speak for myself on a personal as well as professional level to know that Thomas W. Dorse Jr. not only walked this earth, he shook this earth, and he meant so much to so many of us. And thank, thank him, thank God for um, the life and legacy of my friend, my mentor, um, my uh, last thing he said to me was ride or die. And he was my <laughs> ride or die. And I thank God for it. Uh, indeed, indeed. Um, four years ago, I moderated a conversation, Operation Hope, uh, with Butch Graves and Tommy Dorch. We were talking about uh, how do we change the black community with investment. Uh, and just here's some of that conversation. Side, I'm going to take my money that I've earned. I'm going to find the black auto dealer I'm going to find the black dry cleaner. I'm going to find the black investment banker. Get I'm going to find up. the black whatever it might be. And I'm going to put my money in with them. That's not isolating us. That's, that's protecting ourselves. And that is reinvesting in ourselves. That's what has to happen. So it's not a new plan. It is taking the plan and, and, and doing something with it. And, Tom, the reality is that their government does serve a role private serves a role. Look, uh, 1973, Maynard Jackson becomes mayor of Atlanta. At that time, African Americans were receiving 0.0012% of all city contracts. Maynard Jackson comes into Atlanta, Coleman Young in Detroit, Marion Barry comes in D.C. You have this group of black mayors who made it clear that they were going to open up those doors of opportunity for black businesses. And that's how, when you look at the skyline of this city, Russell Construction huge, huge part of that. And so, that, but that's maximizing politics, but you still have to also deal with black-owned businesses also being able to uh, get capacity. Right. For, first of all, you've got to understand that civic engagement is important because we could not have gotten a Maynard Jackson, a Coleman Young and those in office if our community didn't turn out. Sadly, we only had 23% of the eligible voters in this city to turn out in the last mayor's election. But the important thing about their leadership, uh, Maynard Jackson said to us, it doesn't matter whether your name is first, second, or third on the sign outside the door. It's a joint venture. Work together. So you got black people to understand bringing your resources together, you can get a bigger piece of the pie. The other thing was he took on the corporate community here and said to them, we won't build a new airport until you commit to following my suggestion and lead of 25% of the procurement. We, at the time, were over 70% of the city's population. It's amazing that today we still have the program started on the late Maynard Jackson here. We're doing 37% mandated requirement in the city. No other city 
in this country does that. When we expanded the, the airport with the last 5.3 billion expansion, 1.6 billion of that went to mostly black owned businesses in this city. And so we've had that kind of leadership. But back to what Butch was saying, it's still important for us in our community to understand that nobody's gonna give us anything, that we earned it, the government takes taxes from it, it's our money, we should not be begging for that money. But the other important part is nobody should expect that they're gonna get a free meal. You gotta be good at what you do, you gotta be best, but we have to work together. I've been in business 24 years. My biggest challenges have come from black elected officials and black folks who, as I say always, black people, you know, understand there are those of our color who are not of our kind. And there are those of our kind who are not of our color. But we have to still understand it's on us to do our job. Butch, uh, we've seen about a $700,000 um, additional black Before we go, uh, I'll take a personal privilege. I remember it being the Spirit Democracy Awards. Uh, we live streamed it. And uh, Tommy stood up there and made a personal plea. Uh, to those who are attending to support this show, to support what we were doing, because he understood the importance uh, of black-owned media. We often talked about that. Uh, he would always say, uh, how can I be of assistance? How can I help? Uh, and any time he called, and he would call, uh, and uh, if I could do it, uh, I was there. Uh, if I could be there in person, if I could call somebody else. And so Tommy Dorch was certainly one of those folks uh, who uh, loved black people, helped black people, stood with black people, fought for black people. And uh, we're actually over time. Uh, but the reality is uh, the, re the reason why this show is important, because let's just be clear, an MSNBC, a CNN, a Fox News, an ABC, a CBS, an NBC, they're not going to do a story on Tommy Dorch. Uh, they're not going to sit here and devote any time to it, which is also why we must have our own institutions that tell our story, that gives the perspective of individuals who have had a tremendous impact on our lives, not just folks there in Atlanta, but trust me, there are people all across the country who know Tommy Dorch, not just folks who are in 100 Black Men of America, but all across this land because, again, he understood why it was important to be able to touch people in a unique way. Uh, we're going to uh, end this tribute to Tommy Dorsch Jr., who passed away at the age of 72. Uh, Mike Phillips uh, said the last song he played for Tommy before he passed today was Amazing Grace. And so we have Mike Phillips to take us home and as we celebrate the life and legacy of an extraordinary brother, Tommy Dorsch Jr., passed away today at the age of 72. <laughs> Mm-hmm.